Yeah, maybe my girlfriend only exists in my mind, but according to Plato, ideas are more real than reality. Hey guys, welcome back to Kingdom Craft, where we build churches in Minecraft while talking about Christianity. Today I'm going to be starting work on a brand new Presbyterian church here in the Presbyterian province of my Minecraft server. So while I do that, I'm going to be talking about the two biggest, most influential Greek philosophers on Christianity and Christian theology. Now, a lot of people think it's embarrassing for Christianity that our ideas, that the ideas of the church, have been influenced by Greek philosophy. And a lot of people have even tried to, like, purify Christianity by removing the influence of these Greek philosophers. But I think that's completely unnecessary for a few reasons. First of all, the New Testament itself was written in Greek, and draw, draw, uh, it drew on a lot of the ideas of the Greek philosophers. You could say that Romans 1 is sort of an articulation of Platonist philosophy, like we'll get into a bit later. Um, and also, there were a lot of theologians in the early church who believed that God providentially prepared the Greek philosophers uh, for the coming of the Messiah, for the coming of Christ, so that there would be these philosophical building blocks for Christian theologians to later draw on. So yes, the Greek philosophers, they were not Christians, they were pagans, but Christianity has had a strong natural law and natural revelation tradition that says we can still learn from them because they were still able to figure out basic things about the world and even some things about God in a, in a general sense, just not specifically the triune Christian God. But still, there is nothing wrong with Christianity having been influenced by Greek philosophy. As Christians, we can be okay with that, and we can celebrate that, because ancient Greece was where philosophy began. Of course, you know, modern, modern you know, universities and ac academia, they want to try and be more diverse and say, yes, there was philosophy in China and India and who knows where else. Yeah, there was, but nothing like ancient Greece. Ancient Greece was where human philosophy really started. I don't think it's a coincidence that Christianity started in the Hellenistic world, the world that had been recently influenced by the Greek empires. Because I don't believe there are any coincidences at all. I'm a Calvinist, I believe. And you don't have to be a Calvinist to believe that there are no accidents, as Master Uguay said. Uh, you don't have to be a Calvinist to believe that God controls everything. So the two most influential Greek philosophers on Christianity are Plato and Aristotle. Plato was the student of Socrates, uh, who was probably the most famous philosopher ever. The Socratic method is still is very popular today, which basically consists of asking students questions and getting them to figure out the answers themselves. You could say that Jesus kind of used a Socratic method when explaining that he's God, because of course Muslims, when criticizing Christianity, they'll say, oh, where did Jesus ever say, I am God, worship me? And the answer is, he didn't directly say that, but he was kind of using a Socratic method, because he kept asking people, who do you say that I am? And eventually, when people finally realized he was God, when Thomas finally said, my Lord and my God, after Jesus rose from the dead, Jesus blessed him for finally figuring it out. So the Socratic method, Socrates is very influential. And then Plato was the student of Socrates, and then Aristotle was the student of Plato. So Plato and Aristotle, they were both brilliant, they both had a lot of similar ideas. And by the way, I'm not experts in these guys, I'm more, I'm more familiar with the impact that those philosophers have had on the church, more than being an expert on those guys myself. Because I study theology, I'm not primarily a philosopher. I'm not even a real theologian either, I'm a Minecraft YouTuber who's just a nerd about theology. But I do know enough to know the differences in how Plato influenced the church and how Aristotle influenced the church. So they had a lot of they had a lot of things in common. The biggest thing they had in common was they were both realists. There's a difference between a realist or and a nominalist or an anti-realist. A realist says that the categories that we use when talking about things like an apple or a battle axe or a carrot that those are actual, real things. There is some real, metaphysical substance to those things. Those are not simply human labels created to describe things. Like, nominalism is very popular in modern philosophy. Everyone is a philosopher whether they believe they are or not. And a lot of people are modernists without knowing it. A lot of people are nominalists because they say, oh, these categories we make, those are just human constructs. That's why people today will often say gender is a social construct, 
And a lot of conservatives intuitively feel like that's wrong, but because they're philosophically illiterate, they can't articulate why. So they'll appeal to, like, biology. It's good to appeal to biology. But it goes even deeper than that. There is a metaphysical sense in which male and female are real categories, even independent of biology, even though I would say they always correlate with biology. I don't think there's a single example of a person with a Y chromosome who is a woman, or a person without a Y chromosome who is a man. But a lot of, I think the reason that leftist philosophy is able to flourish is because people have such an illiteracy of classical philosophy. It used to be that schools would always teach Latin, and they would always teach classical Greek philosophy. That was just part of the public school curriculum. But now they teach a lot of other weird things like how to annotate random literary work that your English teacher selected, even though your English teacher probably doesn't understand the work that they're assigning, or how to just fill out some busy work homework packet. That's what schools are teaching. They're not teaching philosophy or ethics anymore. Anyway, I'm getting off track. So what are the difference between Plato and Aristotle? Because they both believe that these categories we speak in, like man, woman, dog, fish, I don't know, apple, tree, they, they both believe those are real categories rather than just human labels. The difference is that Aristotle had more of a connection between the physical, the physical substance of a thing and the metaphysical category. So Plato would say the, the metaphysical substance, the metaphysical essence of an apple is inside the apple itself. Whereas Plato would say in that there's a higher world of the forms, a world of ideas that is in some way higher than this real world. And in that higher world of the forms, that's where you can find the essence of an apple. So this debate between Plato and Aristotle has kind of surfaced in some of my college experience. There's a bit of a rivalry between mathematicians and engineers. I'm a math major. For the, my first two years of college, my roommate was in... He wasn't an engineering major. He was just a, a real engineer. Uh, but he was not very good at math, very good at you know physics and engineering. Uh, he'd always need my help for his math homework. I was terrible at physics and engineering, and I would always need his help for that. And you would think math and physics are very, sim uh, very similar, but they're actually not. Because math deals with more of the ideas, and physics deals more with the real. So Plato is called an idealist because he thinks in some way ideas are more real than reality. So Plato would say mathematics is more real than physics, and physics is just how these higher ideas of mathematics apply to the physical world. Whereas an Aristotelian, someone following Aristotle, would say physics is really what's real, and math is kind of just a way to describe physics. There's this age-old debate between um, whether math is something that we created or math, whether math is something we discovered. I strongly think math is something we discovered. I think math is just out there in the higher world of the forms, and we just discovered it. I think things like the Mandelbrot set basically prove this, because the Mandelbrot set is this infinite shape with infinite complexity that doesn't exist anywhere in the universe. It can't because it uses imaginary numbers, and imaginary numbers don't exist in the real universe, but that shape is still real in some sense. It's real in the, in the mathematical world, not in the physical world. And I use that in my video explaining why math proves God, because math proves mathematical Platonism, uh, well, I, that, that's, I shouldn't say math proves it, I would say things in math, like the Mandelbrot set, uh, prove mathematical Platonism, that ideas in mathematics are basically objectively real, even independent from the physical world. Whereas someone following a more Aristotelian idea of math would say math is just something that humans invented to describe the physical world. So how does that apply? Like, in case you don't understand any of that, here's an example. I thought of this myself. This might be a kind of really bad way to think about it. Like I said, I'm not a philosopher. It's you can think of the different approaches men and women have to, you know, romantic relationships. I would say in terms of romantic relationships and, you know, attraction, men are more Aristotelian and women are more Platonist. This is a, a broad, broad generalization. Men are more attracted to the physical form of a woman, whereas women are more attracted to the idea of a man. That's why women are very attracted to male celebrities, or not maybe not attracted as in they actually want to date them, but uh, they are very intrigued by male celebrities, 
in a sense that men often are not interested in female celebrities because women are more attracted to the idea of a man with a lot of status. Whereas women will often be kind of indifferent to seeing a man randomly on the street, even if it's an attractive man. Whereas men might be very attracted to seeing a random woman on the street, but are kind of indifferent to female celebrities because, you know, it's um, th those female celebrities feel a lot more distant, a lot more artificial. Um, of course, there's exceptions to any generalization. Uh, I often speak in generalizations. We have this idea in our culture that it's bad to make generalizations, but that's a very modern idea. Humans evolved, yes, we did evolve, humans evolved to make generalizations. It's how we understand the world. Generalizations are what babies always do in their brain automatically when they're starting to figure out the world. Noticing patterns is built into our, our neurology. So, yes, you always have to clarify that there are exceptions to these generalizations, but they're just that, exceptions. Generally, Men are more, men focus more on the physical substance of a woman, the physical form of a woman, and women will focus more on the idea of a man. So that's uh, one example of difference between a Platonist way of thinking and an Aristotelian way of thinking. I'm not saying that men generally hold to Aristotelian philosophy and women generally hold to Platonist philosophy. There's, there's, I don't think there's any correlation between that. I'm just giving you an example of how Platonism focuses more on higher ideas and Aristotelian philosophy focuses more on the real, focuses more on the physical, the tangible, and all of that. Now, here's an example of how this plays out in Christianity, in the different Christian denominations. So, as I indicated earlier, I sympathize more towards Platonism than Aristotelianism. Now, I don't think Plato was right about everything. There was definitely things Plato was wrong about. I think Plato had too low a view of the physical, uh, because Platonism taken to its extreme is Gnosticism, where you basically, it's a, it's a Christian heresy that basically hates the physical world and thinks the point of Christianity is to escape, is to escape the physical world. I think that's utterly anathema, because Jesus came to redeem the physical world. He didn't come to destroy it. Of course, the, the Bible does say the, the world will be destroyed with fire, but the world in that context simply means the evil ways of this world. So it's going to be more of a purifying fire than just a, like an utterly destructive fire. I think that's a much better way to think of it. Um, because the Bible says the kingdom of our Lord has become the kingdom, I mean the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's really going to be that the world's going to be transformed at Jesus' second coming rather than completely, utterly annihilated and he's just going to start something brand new. I don't believe God ever creates something he's going to destroy in the end. Like, destruction is really just for the sake of later purification. That's the way I see things. So, in that sense, I think Plato was wrong about despising the physical seeing the ideal as more good than the physical, but I still think there's a sense in which ideas are more real than reality, because I think mathematical concepts are more real than physical objects. Because physical objects are always imperfect, they're filled with imperfections, they change, whereas mathematical concepts, whereas numbers are perfect, they don't change, and they are, they are part of the infinite, and that's, I think, Math is the best way of proving God exists, because math proves that there is something infinite that exists outside of our physical world. Um, a lot of people don't like when I start talking about math, they think I'm just spewing a bunch of hogwash, but that doesn't change the fact that I'm still convinced that math proves God. But anyway, um, so there are different Christian denominations tend to follow Plato and Aristotle's ideas a little bit differently. So... In the early church, Plato was prioritized a lot more than Aristotle, especially in St. Augustine. St. Augustine really followed a lot of Plato's ideas. Some might say he's a Neoplatonist, again, because I'm not a philosophy student. I'm not very educated on the differences between Pla Platonism and Neoplatonism. I know that Neoplatonism comes from this guy, Plotinus. But basically, Pla Platonism was very popular at the time of St. Augustine, and St. Augustine is the most influential theologian for Western Christianity. So in the West, for the first, like, thousand years, it was really Plato's philosophy that reigned supreme. People had a very idealistic thing of, a uh, very idealistic view of things. But then in, like, 
the Middle Ages, along came St. Thomas Aquinas. And St. Thomas Aquinas began to draw a lot more on Aristotle than Plato. And Thomas Aquinas is probably the most influential, specifically Roman Catholic theologian. And a lot of Roman Catholic ideas, particularly their view of the Eucharist of communion, which is transubstantiation, that's very influenced by St. Thomas Aquinas. St. Thomas Aquinas uses Aristotle's ideas to explain how the body, how the bread and wine physically become the body and blood of Christ. Because, you know, if you've ever been to a Catholic Mass, you see them do the Eucharist, you see them say the words of institution, but you don't see the bread actually changing appearance, you don't see the wine actually changing appearance into blood, so you're like, okay, how is this transubstantiating? And what St. Thomas Aquinas would say is there's a difference between the real essence of something and the outward appearance. So he would say the outward appearance remains the same, but the essence inside the bread and wine actually changes. It changes substance into the real physical body and blood of Christ. And that is still the official dogmatic Roman Catholic teaching to this day. Um, there was a, a recent survey that said, you know, a lot of Catholic lay people don't actually believe in transubstantiation. It can be hard to accept because it does contradict basic intuition. I'm not saying it's wrong because it contradicts basic intuition. Uh, but that is a, the official belief of the Catholic Church, that when they do the Lord's Supper, the bread and wine physically change into the body and blood of Christ. Now, during the Protestant Reformation, a lot of the Protestant Reformation was going back to the ideas of St. Augustine. Remember, St. Augustine was the guy who followed Plato's ideas more, especially in the Calvinist Reformation, the Reformed tradition, which is what I'm a part of. I'm a Calvinist. Um, a Calvinist, Reformed, Presbyterian, I use those, those words interchangeably. Of course, Calvin hated the word Calvinist. He, he didn't want the church to be named after him. It was originally an insult. Uh, the enemies of the Reformed churches called them Calvinist, and then that name just kind of stuck. Uh, but Reformed theology is in many ways going back to Augustine, going back to the earlier traditions of Augustine, and his philosophy was very Platonist. And the Reformed view of communion, in, in contrast to the Roman Catholic view, is a lot more Platonist. Because in Reformed theology, in Calvinism, if you read the Scots Confession or the Westminster Confession, we do believe that we're receiving the body and blood of Christ, but we don't believe in transubstantiation. We believe the physical form of the bread and wine stays the same, but we believe what we're receiving is the higher heavenly form of the body and blood of Christ. We believe that we're spiritually receiving the body and blood of Christ, and to a Catholic that sounds like a less real version of the real presence. The Catholic might think that's that's sort of diluted because we're saying, oh no, Jesus isn't really present, he's just present spiritually. But because we're drawing on this Platonist philosophy, we think a spiritual presence is even more real than a physical presence. And of course, the Catholics would also say that the body and blood of Christ are spiritually present in addition to being physically present. But the, it's this broader idea that there is less of an intimate, there's less of a union between the physical and the spiritual in Platonist philosophy than in Aristotelian philosophy. Because we can say that we are truly receiving the body and blood of Christ, even if we're not receiving it physically. Because we believe that, if you read the Scots Confession, this is what it says, the body, and, the body and blood of Christ are in heaven, because the physical body of Jesus ascended into heaven after the ascension. But, you know, the reason Pentecost comes after the ascension is because ever since the ascension, the way we commune with Jesus Christ is through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit bridges the gap between us on earth and Jesus, who is in heaven. So that is why, that is why we can still receive the body and blood of Christ, even though they are located in heaven, because the Holy Spirit bridges that gap between space and time, so we can really feed on Christ. So the biggest difference in, like, Platonist versus Aristotelian philosophy in Christianity is, I would say, the Reformed versus Catholic views of the Lord's Supper. Now, you might say, what about Lutheranism? Well, Lutheranism really doesn't like to use philosophy to explain the Lord's Supper. It's like Calvinism and Catholicism, they disagree, but they are agreed on the fact that they should try to explain it philosophically, whereas Lutherans uh, think that they have a lower view of human philosophy. Lutherans simply say, it is the body of Christ, it is still bread, how does that work? We don't know. That's generally the Lutheran approach. And the Baptist approach is, it's not the body of Christ, it's just a symbol. Um, but I would say the most philosophical branches of Christianity um, are Catholicism and Calvinism. And Greek philosophy has influenced all of Christianity, uh, but the 
tr Christian traditions that draw the most on philosophy, that are most intellectual, I would say, are, are Calvinism and Catholicism. Even though I'm n Protestant, I still greatly respect Roman Catholicism. I often say I'm the most pro-Catholic Calvinist you've ever met. So a lot of people ask me, you know, Zoomer, if you respect Catholicism so much, why not, why not just become Catholic? You know, they claim to be the one true church. Maybe they're right about that. Why not just become Catholic? Well, this difference between Aristotelian and Platonic philosophy is at the heart of a lot of the things I actually don't like about Catholicism. The main concern of the Calvinist Reformation with Catholicism, with the Roman Catholic Church, was idolatry, particularly idolizing certain physical things. And I'm, I fear that their Aristotelian philosophy, this sort of connection between the physical and the ideal, can lead to them idolizing certain things. So an example with the Lord's Supper, in a lot of Catholic churches, not all of them, less common in America, but very common in Latin America, you'll see the a lot of superstitions surrounding like the physical substance of the bread and wine and communion. Of course, they think it's not bread and wine anymore. They think it's the real body and blood of Christ. But you'll see people like parading the consecrated Eucharist around the church and people bowing to it. And there's a lot of superstition about the wine as well. For the longest time, the Catholic Church actually denied the blood of Christ in communion to people. They wouldn't serve people the wine because they were worried that people would be clumsy and spill it. Now, of course, in, in, under a Calvinist view of the Lord's Supper, the wine itself is not the blood of Christ. It's just that we're spiritually receiving the blood of Christ when, when we drink the wine. But there's not this direct identity drawn between the wine and the blood of Christ. So it's less of a big deal if you accidentally like spill a drop or um, spill a crumb. But the Catholic view causes a lot of superstition, causes a lot of idolatry around the um, a physical substance. And Lord have mercy if I'm wrong about this, because, you know, I could be wrong about anything, but I don't think I am. You, you don't see this massive, like, superstition in the Bible when, regarding, these, regarding these rituals. Of course, you could say, you know, the Ark of the Covenant randomly zapped someone to death because, just for slightly mishandling it. But I don't think you can draw a direct parallel between the Ark of the Covenant and and the Lord's Supper. As also, another thing is that the Catholic view of icons, I think, is very much influenced by their Aristotelian philosophy. A thing that makes me a bit uncomfortable when I walk into a Catholic church is all the statues that they have everywhere. I think the reason the Catholic Church is so obsessed with statues is because of their Aristotelian philosophy, because they want to make these you know, spiritual realities feel very real and concrete. That's why there's statues everywhere around the Catholic Church. And a lot of the things that Catholics do to those statues seem like a second commandment violation to me. They always, like, bow before the statues and kiss the statues, whether it's statues of Jesus or Mary or one of the saints, whatever. And, you know, I, in, in most cases, I prefer Catholicism to Eastern Orthodoxy, but I like the way that Eastern Orthodox make their icons better than Catholics because Eastern, Eastern Orthodox icons tend to be two-dimensional, whereas Catholic icons are often like three-dimensional. They often make statues. Like I'd prefer to have no icons at all because I'm an iconoclast. I'm a Calvinist. We're iconoclast. But from a Calvinist perspective, two-dimensional icons are better than three-dimensional statues because they feel less real. And it's because we believe that our minds should be raised to heavenly realities rather than gazing upon, you know, statues and bringing our minds down to, to earthly realities. So yeah, that's, a, that's just a difference between how uh, Platonic and Aristotelian philosophy have influenced Christianity. Thank you guys for watching. I know I kind of ramble on about things that I'm honestly not educated on, but like I say, I can be good background noise for while you're doing the dishes. So thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you all later.